Well, good morning, everybody. Um, well, welcome to this edition of the Leaders and Legacies uh, Civil War Talk. My name is Ranger Rebecca, and I'm going to be talking about Civil War archaeology today. Um, before we get started, I'm just curious, has anybody ever explored or been interested in archaeology before? Like, show of hands, a little bit. So for most of us, this is a fresh topic, right? We may not know what archaeology is or anything like that. That's perfectly fine. Um, a lot of times when people think about archaeology, we tend to get this envisionment in our mind, right? <laughs> Lots of treasure hunting and running away from large cannonballs, afraid of snakes. Um, you'll notice I didn't come in wearing a fedora, right? I came in wearing a park ranger hat instead. So um, today my goal is to not only kind of dispel some of the myths that you might see in movies like Indiana Jones or um, in Tomb Raider, stuff like that, and to focus on what archaeology really is about, which um, Dr. Jones does make a good description of. the We don't follow maps to bury treasure, and X never ever, and I'll add ever, marks the spot, right? Um, it's a lot more of a process. Um, and in, in this, too, we'll also discuss how archaeology transitions not only from um, a prehistoric context, but into a historic one, and how it relates to the Civil War as well. Um, to provide a, your sort of basic textbook definitions, right? So archaeology is the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. In the case of this display here, you can see it's very varied, right? There are different types of archaeological processes all around the globe. Uh, for example, you have the kind of archaeology that most folks are typically familiar with, right? Stuff here in the States, out in Arizona, you know, Native American excavations of, say, Pueblos and different things like that. Um, you have our topic of interest today, uh, Civil War archaeology, more in the historic context, um, how we can use excavation to understand um, our more recent past as opposed to our prehistory. Um, you also have different types of methodologies involved as well, right? So you have, um, in southern Ohio especially, uh, the Ohio Valley has a huge history of mound builders, right? And the processes that they have to go through to do excavation and research are a lot different than, say, the folks out in Arizona, right? Their processes are going to be completely different. And believe it or not, there's even underwater archaeology, right? Um, something that the most brave of heart decide to do because you're doing not only analysis and research, but um, putting yourself in a pretty non-traditional environment. Um, archaeology tends to be categorized at an academic level within anthropology. So there's a lot of flip-flop back and forth. Um, just to create a context, anthropology, it is defined as the scientific study of humans, human behavior, and societies of the past and then also the present. Um, anthropology is then broken down into multiple subgroups. So there's social anthropology, cultural anthropology, um, genetic or biological anthropology, and then archaeology. So there's sort of, it's technically like a little subcategory. If you go to, say, like a bigger state that has a lot of archaeology, like here in Ohio or in Arizona, for example, they create its own category. So if you want to go to school for archaeology, that's your degree, right? But if you go to a different institution, they might lump it under this greater category of anthropology just because of how closely the two are related to one another. Um, archaeology is not geology. Right? So if you have questions about uh, fossil, fossil formations and rock formations and things like that, I can't really help you. I'm sorry that <laughs> you have to talk to a geologist for that. Um, some professionals, they do work in tandem. Right, You have to use the natural world and the earth around you to connect to the historic or cultural events that might be happening. Um, archaeologists are also not paleontologists, right? So don't ask me about dinosaur bones because I'm not going to be able to give you any kind of answer about that either, right? They're their own backgrounds and interests as well. Um, the big sort of process for archaeology um, in the field and in practice is referred to as the archaeological process. And so any good archaeologist that has a question or an inquiry, um, bef you would think they're just going to go and start digging, right? But there's a lot more that happens before that, right? Before you start taking shovel to earth, you have to not only come up with a research question, and then from there, you'll pick your site location, right? So let's say, as an example, we're all Civil War interested, right? So we're interested in seeing if there's any new information that can be found 
um, let's say at Gettysburg, right? And so perhaps our historical question would be, you know, based off of doing previous research, right, Gettysburg is run by the National Park Service now, it was run by the National Battlefield Trust before, they've had their fair share of excavations. So before we go and start, you know, digging up earth, we're gonna pick our location, then we're going to do a lot of background research and development. So we're going to read about what other people have published, what other excavations have been done in that place before, to see if maybe the questions we have are similar or different to people who have done research or excavations before us. This will also show us geographically where they dug, right? So it doesn't do us any good to go back and dig in the same exact, you know, four or five meter square that somebody else did, right? It's not going to provide us with any new information. Now that you have a location picked and you have background development created, you're then going to do site survey. So still, before you even break earth, you're going to get a whole team together and you're just going to walk the area, right? You're going to look at the surface. You're going to potentially use the technology available to you. Um, in the old-fashioned way, it's pen and pencil in your own eyes, and you write down the things that you observe that have made it to the surface level. Um, we're not going to touch anything. We're just going to sort of walk across the area that we're interested in. Some people use metal detectors. Some people use um, light readings like LIDAR machines or different things like that. Uh, some people even go all the way up into airplanes and look at the formations of the earth and grass from all the way up in the sky to see if maybe the actual formations are going to tell us uh, where we should potentially be interested in digging. Um, once you've made a good record of all the different things that have made it to the surface, then you're actually going to get into your field work, right? Your excavation. And that'll be the process where you get to use all the fun tools like you folks see here, right? You get to set up all your units and um, you get to eventually get to the nitty gritty with little tools and things like that. But first you got to scrape off all that surface dirt, right? Anything where the grass and plants and trees and roots are all going to get into. Archaeologists like to call that the plow zone or the recent zone, things where humans, active humans or animals might interact with that soil and would potentially um, distract from the stratification that's below. Um, once you've made it down into your period of interest, you're then going to start using all the fun things that we see here and document everything that you do. If you see any types of artifacts, any kinds of discoloration, but in the soils and rocks and things like that, every five centimeters or so that you dig down, you're going to make a new document, write down notes, hand draw, take photographs, uh, make sure that you document every step of the process because, believe it or not, archaeologists is a Archaeology, it's a permanent process. Once you dig that up, once you move an object or the physical earth around it, you can't put it back, right? You can't say, well, I think this kind of clayish looking dirt was here and the not so clayish looking dirt was over here. So making sure that you keep constant records of what you're doing and documenting along the way is incredibly important. Once you've finished your excavation, you've found the pieces that you're interested in, um, a lot of times you then take the objects that you've found or the data you've collected back to some sort of lab. Whether it's you're working through a museum or you're working through a university or a private company. And then you start to create the interpretation component of the objects that you have. Now that you've studied them, what can the things that you've found help tell new people? How can it influence maybe a new story or a new idea? How does it answer your research question? And then finally, archaeologists, a big role is the preservation and information sharing of those objects. So um, in some cases, objects are going to be put into museum storage and properly contained. Um, other times, they'll be used as part of university collections so that future students or public can have access to them. But the biggest thing is that whatever excavation has been done, um, a good archaeological project is typically always published because then that way all of the data and all of the information is available publicly for everybody to see because it doesn't help anybody to go and dig up an excavation unit in say your own backyard or for someone to do something privately if that information then can't be shared with everybody else and they can then learn from it too. Now, I know that's a lot of steps, <laughs> and what we'll do later is we'll talk about some specific sites and some excavations that they had, and we can see how this process sort of plays through throughout. So does that sound okay with folks? Mm -hmm. All right.
Before we get to that though, I do want to touch a little bit about uh, the rules and regulations that come with archaeology, um, especially within the National Park Service. There are lots of um, acts and you know, rules and laws that have been put into place over the years as a way to not only preserve our historical and cultural landscapes, but also to sort of make certain and to unify the way that archaeology is done over time. So for example, a big act that's incredibly popular not only for um, archaeology history but also the history of the Park Service in general is the Antiquities Act of 1906, right? It's the first law that established uh, archaeological sites on public lands are as important public resources. So this includes not only archaeological sites, but historical and natural sites, right? So it's this new framework, this new idea that, hey, maybe these natural and historical and cultural places are actually worth saving, and we should probably look into them a little bit more. Um, I won't go over every single law and regulation because I have a very long list, but <laughs> some other ones, intermediary ones, include the Historic Sites Act of 1935, and then the next big one is the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, this legislation um, intended to preserve historical and archaeological sites in the United States, and it created the National Register of Historic Places and the list of natural historic landmarks and historic preservation offices within your state. Um, I know that that seems like a lot, it all in one act. There were lots of amendments that were made to this, but most recently, um, the Historic Preservation Act did celebrate um, a 50th anniversary, some of the posters that you see here along the bottom. And all of the act's amendments helped to continue this thought towards preservation, how can archaeology be protected, how can cultural and historical landmarks be preserved, but also then made publicly available for other people to use. And so, although it seems like a little while ago in 1966, there's an active conversation always happening and there's active work being done as well. It's not something that was just written into legislation and then sort of forgot of in, in case of certain legal issues. Uh, you then have things like the Archaeological and Historic Preservation Act, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, the Abandoned Shipwreck Act of 1987. But the final most prominent one that tends to come up a lot in the news today is the Native American Graves Repatriation Act of 1990. Um, this act requires that institutions that receive federal funding to inventory their collections, to consult with federally recognized Native American tribes, and to repatriate human remains and other cultural items that meet certain criteria. Um, so the two big words out of this are requires and repatriate. Um, as the National Park Service, we are required to document, to work with tribes, to work with historic institutions, and to make sure that anything that may have been excavated in the past, prior to these laws and regulations, is returned back to its proper tribes and not sitting in a museum collecting dust somewhere. Um, this goes for all new excavation that's done as well. If you even stumble upon any kind of human remains or something that it would be significant towards a burial and in adjacent, in a, uh, close to um, a potential burial site, um, it is required that you reach out to the proper authorities to make sure that at a proper excavation is completed and that if there are human remains that they're taken care of and returned to their proper tribes according, appropriately. Um, the process of returning those items is the repatriation word. So it means there's an analysis done of the human remains or the cultural materials, um, this working with the tribes and local groups and then eventual giving back of these items. So, those are sort of your, your two keywords for that legislation as well. Now working within these frameworks of not only the legal process, but also um, the sort of archeological process itself, um, the question of today, what makes Civil War archeology span different, right? So what makes the process of excavating objects like these different than the process of excavating objects like these? And so, when it comes to Civil War archaeology specifically, 
there is a couple of different types of excavation practices that happen. So the most popular type of Civil War era archaeology is battlefield archaeology, right? It's the process of going to historic battlefields, um, people doing excavation, and a lot of times finding objects that directly pertain to the events that happen there at the battlefield, right? Sometimes it's things like bullets and casings. Other times it's objects such as um, be a big objects like cannons in some big parks they find things like that in like the first image I showed you. Um, you also have the potential for human remains to be found at battlefields and we'll talk about one specific site a little bit later on. Um, another big form of excavation that's popular is conflict archaeology which is similar to battlefield, but the difference is that in conflict archaeology, it doesn't have to be just at a battlefield, right? So if you're going to a battlefield, you're thinking about the events of Gettysburg, the historic documents, primary sources that relate to that battle specifically. But if you go to, say, like a campsite that's away from the battlefield, or another historic building or a structure that may have existed that relates to the war, but isn't necessarily broken down in the day-to-day -day battle events, that's going to help tell a greater story of the sort of cultural and historical process that's surrounding the war, right? So it's not the what general moved where and what soldiers were struck down, et cetera, not that more specific process, which is the battlefield, which is still very important, but in a lot of times, conflict archaeology looks at how many other players are involved. It's not just the soldiers, it's also the people in the communities. And then you also have, too, in some cases, people comparing and contrasting various battles or various wars, um, depending on the types of machinery or the question that they're interested in. Similar to traditional archaeology, um, Civil War archaeology does deal with physical excavation, right? So you have to get down, down and dirty, get your hands in the dirt, and start looking for objects. But what, one of the trickiest things that surrounds the field at the moment is this idea of stratification. And so I'll use this kind of as an example. So when you go out into the field and you, you've done all your research, you've decided where you're going to dig, there's this general rule of thumb, this, that sort of the stratigraphy, the way that the layers of the earth lay beneath your feet, the idea is that the further away they are from your feet, right, like if you're up here on the ground surface, the further you get away, the older the objects are supposed to be, right, because sedimentation has built up over the years. And in a perfect world, everything would look like this, right? You would have all these beautiful, you know, uh, early, early prehistoric cultures and then maybe some uh, sort of early American, say in the case of the US, and then more of maybe like your Civil War and then more recent and then everything up top, right? This in a perfect world would be great. Um, and typically the older the site is, the better chance you have of something looking like this. So the big struggle that Civil War or any other historic type of archaeology faces is they're not dealing with the stuff down here, right? They're dealing with stuff anywhere from like here up, which is really only anywhere from 200 plus years, may, well maybe older, of you know, sedimentary buildup, right? So what you ultimately end up with are stuff like this, right? <laughs> so on a, like a theoretical level, everything's perfectly pristine, right? One layer goes to the next, goes to the next. The image that I showed you is similar to this, this sort of natu natural stratification where sometimes some settlement might settle in more than others, but overall it's pretty clear. You can kind of see the differences over time. But in reality, this is what happens. People who are living at certain time periods, they mm -hmm. dig into the earth of the period before them. And so now you have, for example, walls being built right at this level, but they need to make a foundation, so they're digging all the way down into here. And so when you're all the way up here and you're digging down, you go, oh wow, this is great. These people must have been here for such a long time because as I'm digging, this looks awesome. But then if you go over here and you see that there's multiple other time periods, it starts to get a little bit tricky. The other thing goes for not only natural occurrences that may happen over time, right? The shifting of the earth and tectonic plates and movement and things like that, earthquakes, all kinds of stuff that changes our earth's surface, um, people, but animals. 
I can't tell you how many times I've seen what I think is like a man-made pit or a man-made post hole, and then I see like a groundhog come running out of it, and it's really disheartening. <laughs> it, really, it really causes a lot of trouble. Um, and so you have to be very, very sort of conscientious and um, always sort of see through. And that's why in more recent excavation practices, the technology component is so important. So as an example, if we had a pit like this, with it being so close to the surface, some of the debris that you see in here, let's just say it was, uh, it was burnt, it was a fire pit. So one process that we could use would be um, carbon dating. You could send this materials found in here out for dating, and they'll say, yeah, that was a, a hole that someone dug like a month ago. This isn't helpful for trying to figure out what's going on. But let's say you excavated and you found a burn pit down here, and they're like, yeah, this is closer to like a thousand years ago that somebody had burned these materials. Now you're able to provide a date for this area that you're working in. <laughs> Another big issue that f the sort of historical and Civil War archaeology faces is not only stratification, but this question of how soon is too soon. Um, by those federal standards and regulations that I mentioned, a site, um, a building, lo location is considered historically significant after 50 years. They consider 50 years enough time removed that you can start to think about, create historical questions, um, look at sources, and in some cases in archaeology, start to excavate. The photos that you folks see here are from an ongoing excavation going on at Woodstock. This year is the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, and so uh, archaeologists in a lot of areas were very excited to go out into the field and start asking questions because Although there's a lot written about Woodstock, sung about Woodstock, <laughs> things like that, um, it's interesting from an archaeological perspective, the things that don't get talked about necessarily are the things that might be left behind, right? Where, will pe where were people congregating? What kinds of things might they have eaten or shared together? Um, what kind of trash did they leave behind? I know that doesn't seem really exciting, but it tells us a lot about the way that people were living and interacting with each other. And so in cases like this, we all, we're all okay with this, right? It's exciting. It might seem a little bit too soon, uh, but overall, there's really like no harm in something like this, right? Uh, where the question seems to come up, though, is when you have family involved, lineal ties to a historic event. Um, some people perceive archaeology as like the way Indiana Jones looked, right? It's looting. It's not taking things into context. And so when you're dealing with these more historic events, sometimes people question, well, what difference does it make if you excavate at this area and you find human remains, and that person is the same age as my grandfather or my great-grandfather? Um, it becomes a big point of contention for some people. And although it's never intended, no good archaeologist would ever go grave digging. That's not the process. Never in my archaeological process did I mention, by the way, we go grave digging, right? It's not part of the, hist the historic or cultural inquiry, but it gets a little bit sensitive for people, especially when human remains become involved. And so the way that um, professionals deal with these kinds of questions, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, a lot of times if um, people are found or objects that can be identified as belonged to a person. Um, a lot of times it's within the best interest of that individual to reach out to if there's any existing family still around. Um, and then it puts it on them to make a decision on, you know, what, you know, what will be done of these objects, what would be done of potentially a family member, different things like that. So those are the two sort of biggest questions that um, the field tends to grapple with a little bit. Um, but every excavation is really going to be on sort of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, to give a couple of examples, I um, want to mention, sort of go back to battlefield archaeology, right? So uh, the National Park Service has 158 historic sites, um, battlefield locations, all under various different names. Um, but, but this is just a fraction of the total of the 419 National Park Service locations, right? So the 158 are things where you might find something like this, right? Ride open spaces where excavations have been done, but 
all 419 national parks as part of becoming a monument or a historic site, they go through an archeological process, even at a small <laughs> level, to make sure that whatever grounds they're being encompassed within um, have a record of the cultural material there. Same with our site, just down the street. Archaeological excavations were done at the Garfield home. And although it's not as it, it might not seem as exciting as like battlefield archaeology, you can still learn a lot from the types of materials that were found and how it helps relate back to the Garfield family and their way of life. With battlefield archaeology, there's a lot of different types of methodologies that are used, right? So you're going to be doing a lot of survey, right? Seeing in a lot of cases, these battlefields have been very well preserved. They have a lot of demarcations of fencings and things like that. Um, so a lot of your work is going to be involved not so much within the dirt, but on a lot of uh, surface level things like that. So um, this is a photo from the Ken uh, Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park. Um, a lot of their excavations and things have a lot of survey because they have a lot of built environment, right? So it's not only just things that are in the earth, but various kinds of like builds up and uh, uh, formations, cannons, right? Physical objects that are still on the earth's surface. Um, with that in mind, and when you're doing survey, because of this stratification issue, a lot of times historical materials tend to work their way up to the surface, right? So when we, if we think back to that image I showed you with all of those sort of lines, the historic context objects are going to be not so much all the way down here under the earth, right? But they're going to be a little bit closer. And so when you have natural processes changing and moving <coughs> over time, that's how in a lot of instances, like bullets, pieces of glass, pieces of ceramic, stuff like that, they just naturally work their way up to the surface. And so in a lot of cases, when you're doing survey work, you see that stuff directly on the surface. And it, when you're walking, let's say we had a unit that we're all interested in excavating something that's the size of this room, right? So we're not going to dig up this whole space, but we'd all stand shoulder to shoulder and within our sort of vision, walk from this wall all the way to the back wall. And in that process, in our straight line, we would document all the little things that we may have seen while walking. And with that, let's just say maybe where I'm standing as an example, there was a bunch of things that had made their way to the surface. And maybe about where you are here, sir, the gentleman in the red hat, maybe there was some clusters of some things there. And then all the way in the back by the portrait of the president, right? Let's say there was some things clustered there. So from that survey, we've now informed ourselves that maybe instead of digging this whole huge expanse of area, we may just want to start here by the gentleman in the red hat and by, the, and by President Garfield, right? And if we start there, then we can start to see what in the surrounding area might provide us with more information. This can also be done um, with a lot of the technologies at the time. Again, you have uh, ground penetrating radar, light detection and ranging, this is called LIDAR. Um, and then you also have core testing, which is very popular. It's a newer movement in archaeology. Um, a lot of it pertains to cultural resource management, where you have to, you have to do a lot of archaeology very, very quickly because you're on a deadline from, say, um, a contractor or somebody that wants to build a building, but they've found an object or a few things that would be significant. So instead of digging up a whole unit, like you saw in the images I showed you, you would take sort of like a core sample. You dig it into the ground, and when you pull it up, you can still see those layers of stratification. And if there's objects that would indicate that this is a culturally significant area, all construction, things like that would have to stop and then you would have to fully excavate the area to properly document it. This doesn't necessarily stop the building from being created, but it does document what was there in order to then preserve that information moving forward and hopefully stop or deter other construction in the future. Um, with battlefields, um, coring has become a little bit more popular just because um, a lot of full excavations have been done already. And so let's say if you go to Gettysburg or if you were at um, Kennesaw, right, and you're walking through and you see some objects come up to the surface, instead of um, you know, having to hire a whole team of archaeologists and do a full excavation because they're pretty confident a lot of this area has already been covered, they might do a couple core samples just in the surrounding area 
And then if it does provide a new information, then it is worth to sort of do the full gambit and move forward. Um, I mentioned earlier the benefit of going up from the sky, getting up all the way um, to sort of look at a site survey from above. This process, although in some cases might be a little expensive, right, because you got to get like a helicopter or something like that, it can be very fruitful because vegetation is always going to grow higher in areas where its roots can get deeper, right? So for example, if you look here, you'll see there's sort of consistent discoloration all of where I'm dragging the red light around. So this is an example of a battlefield-like area. Um, this photo is specifically a World War II air raid shelter that used to exist across the street from all of these homes. So you can see how there was a structure here, right? There's exterior walls all along this way, but then it also had all these compartmentalized rooms and spaces. And the reason that you can see that is because everything that's growing here, it's darker, right? Which means the grass is fuller. It has more space for the roots to get down. So the foundations are all where the grass can't grow as high, right? Because the roots are hitting up against something that's in the way. It's hitting up against concrete or something like that. Um, you can also see, too, where in a case like this, you might think like, oh, well, because this is up at the surface, this might be what's the most important. When in reality, if you just get a different perspective or a different angle, you can see kind of the whole picture. And in a lot of cases, this also applies to battlefields. So with something like um, Kennesaw Ridge is an example. Um, not all battlefields still have recreations or modern uh, structures of where, say, like camp settings would have been, things like that. And so if you look at the battlefield sort of like from an aerial view, you can see off to the sides where sort of temporary settlements would have been created. And that helps tell sort of a greater story of what's happening at that location. Another big thing um, with historical archaeology um, tends to be um, not just battlefields, but also where people are gathering, right? And so in this case, we have, there was an excavation done at the Manassas National Battlefield Park. Um, there was discovered um, a pit close to where they already had identified that basically like the medical tents would have been um, just off of the battlefields. And they discovered a new pit. Some bone material had made its way to the surface. And so they decided to do a full excavation. And in the process of digging, they found basically a limb pit just off to the side of where the surgeons were performing amputations. And in the pit, uh, at the top level, there were 11 partial limbs, various artifacts that had been thrown into the pit because it was basically just a trash pit at that point. Um, but through the excavation process, they realized they had more bones than just 11 severed limbs. They also found two full sets of human remains. Um, now, this obviously takes the example from 0 to 100 very quickly, right? The idea of finding 11 severed limbs is a sort of a gruesome, but realistic expectation of something like the Civil War. The medicine practices, the way amputations and things like that were done, it's not surprising that, you know, a doctor or over-glorified butcher in a way would, you know, see so many people and then they'd have to dispose of those materials because those are hazardous. Um, but the fact that they did find two full sets of human remains in the pit starts to set off those red flags as far as a lot of the other like laws and regulations that I mentioned, right? Now it's more than just, well, how are we going to identify this person's arm or this person's femur to their body, right? That might not be possible, but when you have two full sets of bodies, that completely changes the context. Um, just to mention here the images that you see, so the gentleman who's leaning over into the pit here, this is the park superintendent, Brandon Biles. Um, at the time, of the beginnings of the excavations, um, he was an archaeologist and eventually got promoted to superintendent later on. Um, he was the one, he along with Stephen Porter were the ones that led the excavation of the pit and um, were able to document and process 
Um, when a lot of the articles that I was reading to fill up, fill up on this, there was a high intent of trying to match up um, a lot of the carbon dating and objects found near the bodies with uh, documentation that they had at the site. They had a very good record of uh, battles and events and their medical doctor journals of like what, how many amputations they did in a day, different things like that. Um, there was initially a goal to try to match, to try to figure out who these people were. Um, but as of more recently in 2016, um, they were not able to match up the individuals with like a specific name, but the two soldiers were taken to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Washington, D.C. So they have been laid to rest there. Um, the other limbs have um, been properly identified. You can see here um, they're going through the cleaning process, so they're a little bit dirty right here in the field. So when you take them back to the lab, there's a whole set of different processes that you can go through as far as identifying which fragments go with each other, and then also um, if you're going to have a complete set or not. Um, this is the same gentleman that you see here. Um, so Brandon is working um, with the Smithsonian scientist, um, Kari Bullweed, and this was a photo more recently done in 2018. So you can see how the more, like more pressing, right, the sort of the two bodies, those were addressed and buried and taken care of, you know, put to rest a lot quicker. And now with these specimens being at the Smithsonian, um, additional research and documentation can be done to try to see what these limbs maybe tell us something new about the uh, medical practices at the time. Um, just an example, sort of close up for these objects. Um, so one of the femur bones, you can see there was a bullet lodged right into the bone itself. And then this is an x-ray of the same. So you can see, like from here, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between like eroded metal material and bone. But when you look at the x-ray, it's clear to see where that would have entered right into the femur. Um, this photo is a photo of the femur that belonged to one of the full body specimens. So it was an adult. They were able to use the complete skeleton and the way that the cartilage had formed where the femur meets the hip and in a lot of other places as the body develops certain bones start to fuse together quicker. And so they were able to identify the one soldier as a young male, um, 25 to 29 years old, and because of how close this was to his uh, uh, joint socket, he was basically shot in the right buttocks, and then from there, um, it, embedded, it embedded all the way into his bone, so the doctors weren't able to get it out of his body. And then, assumably, from that kind of injury, um, by the time they would have gotten him to the medical, to the medical tent, he was long gone at that point. Um, his remains also had various other areas that were like this, so it wasn't just the one shot. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, um, he had about um, seven other shots in various places of his body as well. So um, it begs the question of why he ended up in the pit, and uh, a lot of the archaeologists there are still sort of questioning this. Um, one theory was that because of his condition, because of how many wounds that he had, um, and they were moving so quickly from location to location that they weren't able to identify as quickly, and so the idea was just to put him in the pit and then move on to the next location. So um, with the archaeological process, thankfully, the folks at uh, Manassas were able to um, find this individual, and now he's been given sort of a proper, uh, proper burial. Um, if you want more information about this excavation, it is on their NPS website, and I can give you that after the talk. Um, you also have, separately from sort of pits and individual objects, um, excavations that just generally relate to people as well. Um, the two excavations that I'm going to mention um, in the time that I have left, um, they were not done by the National Park Service, but rather they were done by state institutions, which is part of the National Historic Preservation Act. There's not only archaeology being done on the federal level, but there's also preservation efforts done on a state and sometimes local level as well, depending on how rich your heritage is in that kind of field. Um, 
one of the excavations was of in Virginia, and it was 40 Confederate um, corpses that had basically been buried in shallow graves. And so this was at a cemetery, right? So now we're kind of getting into this question of how soon is too soon. But the way that they had come across it is, you'll notice that there's more grass here and on the sides. So basically where these graves were was right down the middle of like two large existing plots that were already there. So people who had tombstones um, and various time periods. So the plot kind of ran this way and then the other one ran this way. And so the reason that they were even interested in this area to begin with is they were wanting to create a path between the two and they had no idea that these bodies were here. So in the process of doing a survey and then in the process of starting to dig when they came up on these materials, they realized something was wrong. And then they were able to excavate basically this whole space between the two big plots and they found um, 40 graves. Um, these, again, were very, very shallow at the time and then also were very, very, therefore very, very close to the surface, right? So, you know, today you talk about people being buried six feet down. Well, if your grave's already shallow and then you're already so close to the surface, it can tend to cause a problem. So the folks in Virginia, they were able to um, work with the local historical societies and they believed that they were able to sort of vaguely identify which troop um, it would have belonged to, and so um, from my, re my recent understanding in the excavation work there, um, they are still working with those local groups to try to identify the Confederate soldiers, the things that they were buried with, right, rank marking, stuff like that, um, to the documentary records, and then um, have them, they've all been properly reburied, but the families are being notified if, if in case um, a family member wants to be moved someplace else. Um, one way that this was sort of a positive outcome um, from this whole excavation process is that the state of Virginia identified this as a sort of like a high risk, high importance sort of excavation. And the team was actually awarded um, a grant so that they could properly excavate every single grave, right? So if you're working sometimes with state funding or local funding, um, you might not be able to do like a full multiple month long kind of uh, uh, excavation process just because not only is it time consuming but it, it's expensive to have that many people there I mean for 40 graves that's um, a, they ended up having to dig a 45 by 10 foot trench in order to encompass all of the spaces so um, they were able to get additional support from the state and then therefore take more time to do the research and things like that to properly get these folks back to where they need to be another um, recent excavation that happened in Delaware um, was there was a location uh, identification of unmarked graves of African-American soldiers um, just on the cusp of um, a forest that you see here. Um, it was one of those things from my notes here. Uh, the forest is just on the edge of what was basically like an encampment area in Delaware um, during the Civil War and so they had already identified on the other side of the camp where um, other soldiers, white soldiers, had been buried. And so there was never this thought to sort of look to the other side, right, to go into the woods and see, you know, is there any materials that might have made their way out through there. Um, in, this, in this instance, it was um, one of those cultural resource management moments where there's this unused land of forests that could be cut down and turned into something new. And so in the process of um, starting to do this, there were a few tombstones, like the one that you see here, um, like deeper into the forest, um, but not as many, nearly as many as coordinated with the bodies in the, in the tombs, in the ground. So um, again, with something like this, they found this cultural material, they created this moment of significance, and so they were able to go in and excavate. Um, in instances like this, 
it is a little bit trickier, right, because the records in regards to African Americans for this time isn't as high as, say, like the medical journals for that pit that I mentioned, or even the Confederate soldiers, right, the amounts of letters and things that they may have written. So in the case of this, uh, the state of Delaware is still working to try to identify the bodies and the materials that they worked with, but um, in most cases, um, the bodies have been reburied with proper markings of at least approximate time and cause of death um, over in the cemetery um, next to um, the other white soldiers. Um, so the biggest thing with all of this today is that um, I want all of us to be able to be good stewards of archaeology. And so my biggest suggestion, plea, hope to all of you is that if you ever go to a historic site, don't take something away. <laughs> Right, so if you go to a battlefield or if you go to a location and you've seen objects sort of make their way up to the surface, um, not only in these three examples, but in many, many others, um, with helps from everyday folks that make their walks of life and explore historic and cultural places, when they see things like this, if they just pick it up and take it, no one will ever know if there was something greater or something, another story to tell below the surface. And in some instances, in like federal locations, you'll actually get in a little bit of trouble, right? You don't want to take a, a bullet or something like that from Gettysburg or like a piece of glass that winds up off the parking lot at the, the, our site down the road. Um, but always keep yourself informed, right? Make yourself aware of your surroundings. If you see materials like these um, or others, right? Like the arrowheads and other things that looked like they were made by people. Um, just, I encourage folks to take another minute to sort of sit and think about, hmm, maybe if I see this, I wonder what else could be below the surface. Um, in some cases, it might be nothing, right? That little groundhog may have moved the bullet from 20, <laughs> 20 yards away to cross your path eventually. But um, just to give everybody sort of a second moment of thought and to also, too, um, make yourself aware of the types of people that you should be contacting. So if you are passionate about um, cultural places and history and this happens to you a lot where you come up onto things, um, make yourself aware of who are the cultural resource management firms in your area. Um, the one for Southern Ohio that's the biggest is Gray, uh, Gray and Pape. They're a private company here in the Cleveland area. The archaeology program at Cleveland State does a lot of the work for the city. Um, making yourself aware of your resources in Lake County, different things like that. And then also to um, what your state offices can provide you as well. The State Historic Preservation Office has lots of external links on their website that I won't bombard you with, but you're more than welcome to look through on your own time um, and just keep yourself informed. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for engaging with me today, and I would be more than willing to answer any questions that you folks may have. Thank you. <laughs>